Hi everyone, for our latest Artemis Live interview, I'm delighted to be joined today by Tom Johansmeyer, Head of PCS, a regular with us. He's going to be discussing a recent piece of work undertaken by Tom and his team in PCS, looking into the Insurance Link Securities Market's views on strike, riot and civil commotion, or SRCC risks for short. This type of political violence risk is one that can bring large losses to the insurance and reinsurance industry, and Tom and his team were looking to understand a bit more about the ILS market's appetite for this. And so they've surveyed some roughly 60% of the ILS fund market by their assets under management, around 15 firms involved to find out what the ILS managers themselves think about SRCC and what it might take to make this a class of business they want to add to their underwriting portfolios. So Tom, welcome. Good to see you again. Likewise. Thanks, Steve. Sure. So what prompted your research project? I'm, I'm interested to know, and we're all obviously aware of the political unrest we've seen in recent months and years, um, not just in the US, but around the world as well. But was there something specific that triggered this project? Well, yeah, what specifically triggered it was, you know, what we're looking at now as going on five years of civil unrest in key spots around the world and significant insured losses associated with them. I mean, you know, you can look back to southeastern Turkey in 2016 over, you know, Shirnak, Mardin, New Sidebin, down in that area. Um, Chile in 2019 became the largest insured loss uh, from a SRCC CAD event on record with PCS followed closely by the US riots last year, starting in Minneapolis. So we are looking at a, a five-year continuum of civil unrest and insurance industry implication. But last year, what really did it was not just the scale of insured loss from SRCC for the second year in a row, also the fact that it was US and the fact that a couple of ILS funds started poking around and seeing if there were ways to uh, either hedge their own books effectively or help their traded partners do the same. Mm, interesting. So what sort of response did you get? How, how receptive were the ILS fund managers? And, and I assume you spoke with a, a broad cross section of the market. Yeah, yeah. We spoke with some of the largest, some of the smallest and a bunch in between. And what was surprising was the non-negativity toward the class of business. You know, you, you walk in and think, okay, nat cat, nat cat, nat cat. That's what the ILS market wants. You know, in the back of your head, you've got this voice telling you property cat was, you know, the first stop, not a destination. ILS has always wanted more than this. But realistically, it's been nat cat. And you wonder about ILS fund mandates, you know, the difficulties um, regarding perception of SRCC. We hear a lot of this with cyber as well. So my thought going in was, are these guys allowed to trade SRCC and are they allowed to do so um, in any meaningful volume or, or is it part of that small illiquid or exotic allocation they're allowed? Mm, yeah, because those mandates can be quite restrictive, can't they, when it comes to looking at something new? They can. Well, it turns out the mandates themselves weren't as restrictive as I'd expected. We figure there's a maybe high single digit amount of ILS capital that is prevented from moving into SRCC and other similar asset classes. There was a, a subset of the industry that found they can do it, but they don't like it. You know, be it geopolitical risk, be it uh, the difficulties of underwriting the human condition, uh, or simply the, the lack of credible modeling or the lack of historical data and reference points. Mm -hmm. So you've got basically, you know, at one end mandate, right? The other end, you've got the spectrum, you've got trading. And we found there was a lot in the middle that was like, well, you know, some don't like it, some are interested in it. And the reasons why they may fall along that spectrum vary from, you know, perception and having a difficult conversation with investors about the issues that cause political violence. And at the other end, hey, we want to see more of this, but we're just not getting the deal flow we need structured or priced the way we needed to. 
Mm. And I guess when it comes down to it, it's probably no more difficult having that conversation with investors about a political violence event than it is a freeze event in Texas that drives billions of dollars of losses. There's always going to be uncertainty there. Um, and some RLS funds have been writing some terror risk, haven't they? So um, would yeah, political would. violence be a natural next step? Possibly. So it's tough, right? Because you, you take the tough conversation that follows in Texas freeze or a hurricane. I mean, you, you think about the, the human impact of a hurricane, right? It, it's awful. You know, we, we've all, we all remember the news clips from Hurricane Maria, for example. So having that conversation with an end investor is difficult. No mm -hmm. question. Tough things are happening to people, you know, for, you know, just because nature made it happen. The difference between that and political violence is intent, right? Nature is not targeting anybody. Nature is not doing anything. Uh, with political violence, you, you've got the issue of people as the driver of the laws. And then within that, you've got issues of, you've got sensitive issues around what caused it, why it occurred, what are the justice issues underpinning it. Uh, I'll never forget reading that Reuters right after 9-11, refused to use the word terrorist in their reporting because it was inherently biased. You know, one's terrorist is another's freedom fighter. So in order to be truly neutral, they had to go in between those two terms. And you wind up with flavors of that challenge in talking about political violence. So yeah, you've got the political violence kind of umbrella. And within that, you've got, you know, war, terror, strike, riot, civil commotion. Um, there has been some terror traded, a decent amount over the years. I mean, obviously nothing to match the scale of NatCap, but certainly it's not an unusual trade. Now, the reasons terror is easier to discuss, A, you've got a history of trading it. Um, you've got indices that have tracked it, BCS. Um, and you've got a trigger point, normally this stuff I think triggers one or two billion, there hasn't been much that's reached that level, right? You know, 9-11, the obvious outlier was, you know, magnitude is larger than the next largest terror event, which I believe was 93 Bishop's Gate. So and those are the only two I think we have on record with PCS global terror that exceeded a billion dollars going back 30 years. So you, you don't have the odds of having to have that tough conversation aren't so high. And then on top of that, you've got infrastructure, right? You've got the terror pools around the world, like extremists and consortio and Pulri, Sangaria. So you know, you've got enough stuff out there to make the conversation more manageable because there is a sector in place. With Riot, you don't have that. And you also have the X factor of an absence of intent or political or religious motivation. So how do you characterize it? How do you define it? How do you plan for it? You know, you can track terror developments more easily because you've got identified groups that can be monitored. Um, SRCC is not as easily packaged as a risk. Right. That's interesting. So that's how you sort of how the perception of SRCC and political violence sits in the industry and sort of the perception of it is obviously important in getting a groundswell of people who are going to back transactions, but you also obviously need buyers of protection as well. Um, what, are, what are the other factors that matter in trying to encourage the ILS market to look more readily at these types of risks? Well, you know, modeling keeps coming up. Mm. You know, you've got it's hard to model the human condition and it's hard to model when you don't have historical data and historical losses. Now we think the data situation's not as bad as everyone thinks. The difficulty is that, you know, there's a certain collection of insured loss data that everybody likes, right? You know, when you're doing a cap bond, you go to the historical PCS data to see what happened for hurricane or, or what have you. And with SRCC, you don't have as much history there. We've only got 13 terror events on record in the US going back to 1950. And most of them were tiny, right? Mm. So what you've got now is, okay, you've got to supplement this core data that you want, 
with data for approximation. I mean, Veris Maplecroft's got stuff that's fantastic, um, but it's not stuff that's been put, put in front of the insurance industry, you know, all that readily over the years. So you can supplement the modeling with outside data. That goes a long way. Um, the tricky part after that is you know, getting deal flow. So if you've got the modeling and analytics in place, you can then push out the deal flow and start to work out a uh, price point relative to the risk. Now, what I have seen is that there is appetite to trade SRCC even as it is now uh, without advanced modeling or analytical capabilities, which is not unusual, right? You and I both know some of the ILWs over the years, non-US that have been traded on Lime Street have been questionable, right? You know, triggering off the newspaper, that kind of thing. So given that that has happened, the notion of trading SRCC on a reliable trigger like a PCS isn't all that unrealistic. The difficulty is a figuring out how much of a novelty premium you can get into the deal, right? To make the trade clear. You know, obviously you've got novelty premium for the seller, you've got the buyer wants to bring that down a bit, it can be done. Um, we saw a couple of funds attempt this early stage in Q4 last year, but they just ran out of time. And the reason they ran out of time wasn't the novelty premium or the strike or even the analytical work, it was just the lack of familiarity. Mm -hmm. So the reason we did the research, Steve, that you uh, kicked off this interview with is to help the market understand kind of where we are right now. The reason PCS has been so vocal over the past 12 months on SRCC isn't just the fact that it's become a much larger problem than it was a year ago. Uh, it's also to help the market understand and contextualize the risk a little bit. That way, you know, when you go to an, your investment committee or you go to your investor and to do an ILW trade on SRCC, you're not making it up. You're not stammering when you get tough questions. You can build your case with a big stack of context that uh, we've helped provide and say, look, this is how the risk works. This is how you understand it. You know, the key issues you have to worry about aren't so much major cities or government capitals uh, because government capitals generally don't have as many insured buildings, your centers of government, major cities, you know, the riot prone areas aren't as susceptible to fire. You know, but if you're looking at kind of second cities like Minneapolis, where you've got suburban style architecture inside city limits, okay, strip malls burn. That's a more important SRCC issue, right? So these are the things we're trying to package together and have been over the past year. The, the survey we conducted with the 15 ILS funds was the missing piece in that, right? So we've looked at the risk. We've looked at strike rise, civil commotion. We've contemplated it in the US, in Chile, Turkey, uh, Gilets Jaunes in France. I mean, we, we really looked at the problem and we've discussed it and we've characterized it and we've brought information and data and perspective to it. The next step is, okay, how do we capitalize a trading environment? And that's where the ILS market comes in. One of the things that's always really frustrated me from either the lay folks or even the more traditional market is when they see something weird, a frustrating risk, their first thought is, we can just toss that into the ILS market. No, you can't. <laughs> you know, you've got to have the right price. You've got to have vulnerability. You've got to be able to make a case. And what I wanted to find out is, is it worth making a case? Does the mandate prevent it? What we learned is it is very much worth making a case. And given some of the pullback we've seen from the SRCC space in the original insurance sector and some of the concerns we're seeing about it in the reinsurance sector, yeah, now is the time to help the ILS market understand SRCC because in the next couple of years, I can see them becoming a really important part of the solution for keeping this risk properly managed and insured properly protected. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. So there's there's clearly a, a been a bit of a pullback, as you said, in some of the specialty markets on these types of risks. Do you think um, ILS Capital can come in as a sort of retrocessional support for them? I think that's the place to start. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, um, I mean, we're seeing the problem all the way down to like major retailers are um, seeing SRCC excluded from the property programs, right? And yeah. you know, got a retailer with three, four, five hundred million dollars in cover, they turn to the political violence market for that, which 
I got a, got hit a bit in 2020 from George Floyd riots. They're probably not rushing out to write this business now. And he, even a year ago, right? One retailer had to go to the PV market to replace excluded SRCC and only got a fraction of what they lost. So we now see a protection gap forming in real time. So for the ILS folks, yeah, I could see them coming in and saying, right, let's provide some blanket eye level capacity to help reinsurers manage this risk more effectively and not have to just exclude it um, on its face, right? Sure. That would give end insurers a little bit of wiggle room as well and help smooth out some of the tough parts rather than just blanket exclude the risk and start from scratch. Mm. So it sounds like this is something that the yeah, industry loss triggers or potentially even parametric triggers may be a, a good place to start, um, particularly as there's a little a, a bit of uncertainty probably about claims development on a on a risk like this. It, it's it's interesting, yeah. The the uncertainty of claims development, uh, we saw it a bit, right? There there were things we saw uh, with the U.S. last year where we we suspected it was going to just run the table, but it took time, which frankly is the benefit of an industry loss index, right? We go off projected, so we can kind of cut the tail a bit on some of these cats. Um, a parametric solution would definitely accelerate that. The tricky part is finding the right parameters. Mm. I, I like parametric for terror a lot better. Uh, we looked at this with Maplecroft maybe five years ago and had uh, a product we were working on for aggregate fatalities from terror events uh, of a certain magnitude. So literally you had aggregate fatalities and then you had a franchise deductible in the form of fatalities as well, right? So if you had a, a 5,000 ag with a, a 200 FD as grim as this is, that would mean 5,000 fatalities from terror events in a year with an event having to cause at least 200 fatalities to contribute to that. Um, that works effectively because that's an uh, important measure or useful measure for terror. You could do it on wounded or casualties as well. Uh, the difficulty with SRCC is that it's less about fatalities relative to insurance. So the best example is the July rise last year on Chicago's Magnificent Mile, which was not designated a PCS catastrophe. Why? Because the insured losses didn't get high enough. We have a $25 million threshold and it couldn't even reach that. So you had several hundred people arrested, a couple hundred businesses affected. So on a parametric basis, those are the sorts of numbers that get your attention. Mm. Problem is they don't correspond to any insured, significant insured loss. You had vandalism, you had smashed windows, damaged interiors, stolen inventory. Uh, even with a couple of hundred businesses affected, it's hard to get to 25 million that way, let yeah. alone a billion plus that the retro market would care about. So, you know, what we found is that businesses, if you wanted to dig down, businesses sustaining fire loss seem to be the best indicator because fire damage is what leads to protract, protract the rebuild period and thus protracted BI. Yeah. But doing that on a parametric basis, it's hard to get a good data source for that, even if you used a third-party reporting agent, which I, I've thought about, right? So I've looked at this as PCS is a parametric reporting agent, which we've done in cyber and which we looked at at Terror, right? How would we go about this? And the notion of using burned buildings to approximate industry impact it's trying to solve for something an ILW already does well. Yeah. Yeah. No, it sounds like that's more of a proxy for the economic impact and the human suffering than anything else. Um, yeah. And you, you can probably do something with it, aerial or satellite imagery. But at that point, you're now looking at a massive investment to parametric, which would skew the deal economics for sure. a decade. I mean, so yeah. you kind of put yourself out of, a, of an efficient solution that way. Yeah. So, so what what do you think are the main barriers right now to um, to getting trades done in this space, and and how do we begin to unblock some of those? I think the main barrier right now is taking action when it's not immediately necessary. Right. So, in October, 
with the election coming and with a summer of riots behind us, uh, ILS funds were worried about the risk and nobody knew what was gonna happen the Wednesday after the election. So uh, a period of uncertainty that protracted into early January with um, you know, the, the Georgia runoffs followed by the, uh, the January 6th election certification, which led to riots again, right? So once that period of uncertainty passed, the risk receded and folks were less worried about it. You know, come February, you're thinking about the Japanese renewal and the Florida renewal. You're less worried about what happened six, nine months ago. So what we need is to sit down and think, okay, is there an ongoing use case here that makes it worth thinking about you know, kind of off peak terror risk, which is even, even now, I don't know that I'd call now off peak, it's just not imminent. You know, but is it worth investing time and effort into doing some trades? Is there economic value for these ILS funds and their, and their trading partners in doing some proof of concept trades uh, over the summer, for example? Uh, in order to understand the market. Mm -hmm. I believe so. I mean, you know, I, I just think back a couple of years when I was talking to several cyber reinsurers about the need to do some proof of concept ILW trades so that they'd have that capacity available to them when the market tightened up. They did not, the market tightened up and now we've got obviously some capacity issues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if we want to prevent this same problem from happening in SRCC, it would be a good idea to get in front of a couple of proof of concept trades. Longer mm -hmm. term, I think we have to look at identifying the new data sources or the new to the insurance industry data sources that are available on SRCC that folks could use to then inform some analytical exercises, even if not independent vendor models, uh, internal models and actuarial exercises that are gonna help folks understand the risk more effectively. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And is there any risk with this type of event of leakage into catastrophe programs, for example, or is this something that's already tightly excluded? It's tough. Um, we're not hearing it's tightly excluded. Hmm. Um, it's just not big enough yet to worry folks. Right. If you've got a couple of billion dollar um, SRCC industry loss. You know, that's at the low end of big Texas hail, just to give you a benchmark. Uh, it, it's not reaching the levels that a hurricane or an earthquake would, and that's the stuff that really moves the market, right? So, so far, SRCC for CAT programs hasn't been a massive concern. You know, there, there were losses. It, it's always interesting when you walk up and down Front Street down here, and folks are saying, oh, yeah, no, we, we heard there are losses. We're, we're really not affected all that much. Like, yes, you were. I get it. <laughs> um, same thing on Lime Street, right? So we know people got affected, but it, it wasn't a year-defining impact. But what's interesting, though, is when you look at, you know, riots in successive years, Chile in 19, U.S. in 20, uh, having multiple billions of dollars of the losses each, it makes you rethink what the ceiling is. Mm. You know, if before 2019, the biggest industry loss was under a billion dollars, then what do you think a worst case is? A billion, two, three, right? You, you're stretching to think about how bad it could get. But now that the bar has been reset, you've got to rethink what the upper limit conceivably could be. And you know, could we now imagine a type of riot that would impact the reinsurance industry, uh, CAT programs? Yeah, absolutely. Mm, interesting. And I guess the Chile riots um, the other year also showed that there's potential for sort of aggregated exposure to hit single corporate entities and that sort of thing as well. So. Potentially that also drives home the need for more insurance protection, which obviously only plays into the need for more reinsurance and shows a greater role for ILS. Fascinating point, actually. Since 2016, even, it's been large commercial programs that have disproportionately moved these industry losses in SRCT. 
So in Turkey, 10% of a cat in 2016 came from, call it four or five insureds. In Chile, a third of it, much larger than the Turkish event, came from um, five retailers, four or five retailers. So roughly a billion dollars of industry loss. And then in the US, same thing, roughly a billion of it came from a handful of large retailers. So there are a number of issues there, yeah, around the, the nature and character of the risk that highlights protection gap. And with Chile, Chile got hit. That's a $3 billion, almost $3 billion industry loss in a country with 19 million people. That's eye-opening. Mm. Now, you also had significant uh, SRCC activity in Ecuador and Colombia at the same time. Uh, Ecuador, I believe, had a billion dollars economic. So the insurance penetration wasn't the same, uh, but a billion dollars of economic loss from SRCC in Ecuador is eye-opening. Uh, Colombia, not quite as big, but still significant, right? And now you know, we're seeing what nine or 10 days of SRCC in Colombia as we speak. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to have an insurance industry impact, at least not of any significant magnitude, but it's the sort of thing that makes you stop and think like the world is not a peaceful place right now. And as insurers, reinsurers, retro riders, our community has to think about how we can marshal the capacity to help our clients at each step in the value chain and ultimately help them, you know, kind of realize the insurance industry's social mission around uh, stability and helping people recover from bad situations. Absolutely. Tom, thank you. Really appreciate your time today. That was a very interesting chat. Um, we'll look forward to speaking again soon and I'm sure we'll eventually see some SRCC deals come to market in the years to come. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Tom.